final reaction to Mr. Asarata's ReZero Season 3 Episode 8 content. It's been a... Uh, just like, you know, with the other ReZero channels that we farm. Echidna, Annie News, you know, Jake, Asarata. Thank you so much for the support and the uh, content. And let's get it. The finale of Core 1 is here, and with it, we have the deciding of matchups, as well as the start of our first fight that I'm sure some of you are dying to see. And of course, loads of cut content. As this episode covered around 100 pages, we start in a meeting where it's time to discuss the demands officially. Subaru reaffirms the idea of the artificial spirit being about Beatrice, and Otto speaks up. Mm. Actually, he's the one with the Tome of Wisdom. Cue confusion on everyone's faces. Otto has no intention of saying more than that, though, only giving them tidbits of information. When Otto found so it, suspicious. it was all burnt up and not usable anymore, so he- At that point, I should have already thought that he picked it up from Season 2. That burnt and tattered part, it's like, it should have been, you know, when Ram threw the grimoire into the fire. Took me a little while to realize. He found a guy in Pristella who could use restoration magic to repair it. And that's where he was yesterday. Anything other than that is a matter of internal affairs for the camp. There are two, in my opinion, pretty sizable characterization cuts to this small encounter, which we can get to later. Okay. Before long, Liliana bursts into this room in song, and of course, with Liliana, comes Priscilla. Al shoots up in excitement, running to his princess before he gets slammed in the helmet with a fan, knocking him into Liliana. <laughs> Poor Liliana. Again, Al's excitement, his mannerisms when a greeting Priscilla felt like a Subaru cringe moment yelling EMT to Amelia. More parallels. She steps on his head asking why he was messing around with these commoners instead of serving her, as Subaru and Otto exit the room to discuss the Tome of Wisdom. He tells Subaru that one year ago, he picked up the remains of the book at the sanctuary and that he wanted to ascertain its contents due to it belonging to nobody other than Roswell Elmathers, because he does not trust the Margrave whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Even before the sanctuary, he would have been scheming all sorts of things, and Otto takes issue with how everyone has seemingly forgiven him. Subaru says- Yeah, I mean, there was the vow, curse, thing, whatever is on Roswell's chest at the end of season two we were talking about, but- that's pretty much just like, at that point, he would no longer scheme. But the whole thing is the time lag situation. What if he already had plans within plans that was already set and the seeds would blossom in the future? And that's what we want to really confirm before anything of Roswell, I think. He hasn't forgiven him. They just need his power and Otto interrupts him. It's fine for them to be naive because Otto will be vigilant on their behalf. It is nice for us to be naive. Because Otto is sus. What's he doing, bro? Is this a misdirection again? Am I just being suspicious for no reason? What's up with this guy? I don't think I can trust him. As the internal affairs officer, he hasn't noticed any schemes from Roswell in the past year, but what if he was planning something before this past year? You never know. If Otto could look inside the Tome of Wisdom, he would get insight into any plots Roswell has laid already. The priority is the control tower, so Otto will have to retrieve the book on his own, but Otto is particularly adept at survival as the two fist bump and Wilhelm appears. Otto heads back in as Subaru asks Wilhelm about Krush to find out that she's woken up and wants to talk to Subaru. Entering the room, he sees Felix covered in blood. Can't speak, sorry, can't spell Felix without an L. But seeing Krush covered in a black wriggling mass just like his own leg. Felix digs his nails into his own arm, regretting his powerlessness more than anyone else ever could. Subaru can't help but wonder why. Is this really the same thing he's affected by? It didn't hurt him, nor did it cause him to be bedridden. Crucia <laughs> yeah, because it wasn't on your face, right? Is how glad she is that he's okay. He had been thinking that it would be so much easier if she just blamed him. Because of that, he had looked down on her noble spirit and doubted her virtue. She had simply been worried for him, worried that he was suffering the same excruciating pain that she was. Right, the characterization here is that Krush cares so much for Subaru more than Subaru could ever realize because he is so he hates himself he doesn't he was blaming himself high standards blames himself for this shit and he's like oh shit Krush actually cares more he feels sorry for doubting her for her having to suffer like that for being unable to do anything to relieve her pain it all melted together into one great ball of remorse so he reached out and took her limp hand and for a moment Intense pain coursed through his veins, like he grabbed a red-hot iron. Joining his leg and being covered in a black mess, Subaru's hand now has the curse as well. Crazy. Ferris tries to heal it, but nothing happens, and when they look over, they can't help but notice that the curse on Krush's arm has faded just a bit. Subaru gets back up and touches Krush's face, and that agonizing curse flows into him again. It's a very funny-looking frame here. During the heat of the moment, like, it's a very serious moment, but now that I look at it like this, 
This is actually a very memeable face. Taking off his jacket, however, it's not a one to one transferal, more like a one to ten. As That's right. The amount of curse that we took out, right? It wasn't like direct. Subaru definitely like it costed him a lot more. But what does that really mean? What does his arm do now? Is it just regen? Same shit. You cut it, it just regenerates. No pain. That's it. His entire arm is now covered in the curse. Despite her pleas to stop, it's not enough to stop Subaru, but Cruz refuses again. The people need him more than they need her. He said it himself. Leave everything to him. She tells him to follow through on his word, and to say it one more time, just for her. Just leave everything to me. Damn. Ferris asks what he should do, and Subaru says... <laughs> I don't know, Felix. What can you do? That there will be countless people he can save, but Ferris is crestfallen. He's stuck. He couldn't save the one person he most wanted to. Stepping out, Subaru runs into Wilhelm, who notices his hand, and updates Subaru on the two witch cold fighters from earlier. The first is Eight Arms Kurgan, Kurgan, the strongest swordsman of the Vlaken Empire, a powerful sword hand. Vlaken, baby! Is it Vlakia or is it Vlakia? Who commands Eight Arms, who should have died over ten years ago. The other is the previous generation's sword saint, Teresia von Astraea, who should have died fifteen years ago on the Great Conquest against the White Whale, a reveal that doesn't shock anybody who knows about the content from earlier mm -hmm. in the series. 40 to 50 years ago, the Demi-Human War was ongoing, and in it, there was a figure who utilized the forbidden art of controlling dead bodies. This is Sphinx, right? That person has since been killed, but the problem is the art itself. Wilhelm makes one request, don't tell Reinhard, asking Subaru if he knows about the- The voice actress says Velaki the way I do? But here's the thing. The voice actors also say Typhon as Typhon. What's more correct? Is there a correct one? I don't really care. I care about what's consistent with what the anime is saying. And yes, there's Japanese pronunciation that's limit, you know, and it's kind of limited due to their just way of talking that some English words won't be said out right, I guess, to like a Western audience. But fuck it, I roll what the Japanese voice actors say. The divine protection of the sword saint. What truly separates it is the ability for the divine protection to be passed down within the Astrea family. And the divine protection itself selects the next sword saint for the bloodline. In the middle of her battle with the White Whale, the Divine Protection went to Reinhardt. It's funny that, like, the Sword God, if the Sword God is at play here, they skipped a grown-ass Heinkel and gave it to, like, a nine-year-old or, like, a five-year-old boy. Just think about that. Isn't that insane? That you already have a grown-ass Heinkel, the dad, the son of the Sword Demon and the Sword Saint. And he's like, nope. You trash. I'm gonna give it to this toddler instead. And she became nothing more than an ordinary woman. It was none other than Wilhelm who stole the sword away from his wife, and it was he who made the woman beloved by the sword god abandon her sword. We have a mention of the sword god here, and it's seemingly related to the divine protection. What does that mean? Leave your comments below. As I don't know if the sword god exists, though. Is that an actual thing? Or is it a belief? Some sort of, like greater entity that they believe is blessing the Austria family with the Sword Saint Divine Protection. I thought that's just old Lagna shit. I don't know if the Sword God exists or not. Maybe it's just a, uh, a title that they believe is at work due to blessing our family. And, I mean, Reinhardt, even if he was like five years old or whatever, I'm sure the moment he came out of the womb, he was already just chosen, right? So, it does make sense why a grown-ass Heinkel who's just kind of mediocre would be washed away and a child would be chosen because he seems to be the child of God. The child of the... Sword God. As we return to the meeting, there is an air of unbelievability towards something Priscilla just said. She will go to the 4th District in battle with Wrath, along with Liliana. Subaru can confirm that Liliana's voice counters Wrath's authority, though they're unsure why, and asks Reinhardt if he has a way to confirm it, before suddenly hearing, I received it. He wished for the Divine Protection of Judgment, That's right. and got it. And he can now look at someone to tell what Divine Protections they have, confirming that Liliana is in possession of the Divine Protection of Telepathy. Crazy. Priscilla and Liliana vs. Sirius is locked in, and they move to confirm Wilhelm and Garfield vs. Capella. They both have bones to pick, with Garfield and his ever-amounting trauma, and Wilhelm and his dead wife being puppeteered. Reinhardt, however, rejects this match- This matchup is so lopsided, though. Capella's side has Kurgan, Teresia, and Capella, and all the minions. We're only sending Wilhelm and Garfield in there? There has to be more going there. We need to send Al, but Al ain't doing shit. Shep. Wilhelm cannot steal himself. He isn't cool-headed enough. And Wilhelm understands his grandson's apprehension. He is half-hearted, but because of that, he never once held back in the face of what needed to be done. His fierce grin had banished his gentle expression, 
and what appeared was the face of a devil starved for blood. Hmm. When he has decided to bear his sword, his heart burns with an unbearable heat. I feel like Wilhelm could definitely die the next coming arc. Sorry, this, the second you know, part of arc 5. He's already had like this moment where he should have almost died back during the subjugation of the White Whale in Season 1. And then I thought his character arc would be over, but it's like, keep going. And with the whole Theresia sub, it almost feels like Wilhelm kind of like wants to die. He wants to meet his end, get some closure with like Theresia. It, and it would be very tragic because Reinhard, Wilhelm, you know, the family situation, it's not very good. And a really tragic but beautiful way to kind of end this and, you know, bring it to conclusion is like Wilhelm crashes out. He's bloodthirsty. He just wants, you know, to handle business. Reinhardt at the end, maybe there's like a heart touching moment where Wilhelm's about to, ha you know, have his final breath and he says sorry or whatever. And it, it like closes that gap in grandfather and son relationship. He just feels like a prime candidate to die. Not cool head. That's how he always is on the battlefield. Wilhelm turns to Subaru and asks him to take Reinhardt on the greed fight. A monster who is unaffected by attacks of any kind, it sounds like the perfect battlefield for the Sword Saint. Garfield stands up and asks Reinhardt as well, calling himself a failure as a guard. He hasn't been able to carry the role he was given, and because of that, on the biggest stage of this huge fight, he's trying desperately to repay the debts he owes other people instead of fighting for his own camp. Garfield, I think this is a moment of like development, right? Just uh, submitting. Is it submitting? It's more of a like not having irrational beef with someone strong as Reinhardt and accepting that there is weakness in him, but he can definitely do better and he wants to have a moment of redemption. So instead of just like always being angry and blaming other people, this is what Felix should be doing, bro. <laughs> this is what Felix should be doing. Fucking own up to your lack of, you know, I don't know, talent, your skills or whatever, and fucking do something rather than just being upset at everyone else. Reinhardt asks for Garf's word. Just as he has his expectations for Reinhardt, he wants Garfield's word that he will follow through on his end as well. Mm -hmm. Finally, Reinhardt and Subaru vs. Regulus is locked in. Subaru vs. Regulus was expected for character-related purposes, and mm -hmm. having Reinhardt on his side will be a big boost. More than a big boost, right? Subaru vs. Regulus would never work out. How the fuck would that even work out? We can't win! It, it, it would be a very, very creative battle if it was truly a Subaru versus Regulus, and Regulus would have to be super cocky, and, you know, be playing around, toying with his food. Many different things would have to go right on our side to somehow, some way, remove his authority, and have to have this one, like, silver bullet moment of, like, the one thing that can defeat Regulus, even if you're, like, a normal person. It, it's just, there's no way. There's, there's fucking no way, right? A Super Versus, you know, uh, Regulus, it's a 0% chance. But with Reinhardt here, now it's like, okay, now we actually have a chance. Subaru apologizes for always relying on Reinhardt, but he'll do his best to make up for everything he might be lacking. And Reinhardt is shocked for a second. It's a very nice quick moment of Reinhardt being surprised at someone realizing that he's human, not thinking the right. of him, and thinking that he might have faults. Right. Remember, Reinhardt has this, like, insecurity as a being because... He doesn't think that he deserves all this power, right? He is quite humble. And all that shit kind of like has to do with being such a powerful chosen being in this world, yet he can't do shit about his family drama and stuff. And his self-worth, his perception of himself. Now that Subaru reaches out and says, bro, I can help you out too. It's just kind of like a shocking, cathartic moment where he's like, huh, you? You're treating me like a normal person? This is kind of nice. The next matchup to be locked in is Julius and Ricardo versus Gluttony. Of course, they don't seem to be aware that there are two, so both Gluttonies do not get a matchup, meaning one will be loose somewhere in the city. I'll do something. Um, it's looking like there isn't a third Gluttony, or even if there is, they're not going to be present in Pristilla because, you know, the whole constellation names based off of Batankaitos and Alford or whatever. It relates to the white whale and the black serpent, and I thought there'd be something with a great rabbit, but the posters also doesn't show, you know, a third gluttony. Maybe the poster is intentionally hiding what's gonna happen in the future. I I'm not sure, but so far it doesn't look like a third's coming. There is a bit of cut information that anime only might like to know about the matchups, but we'll save it for the end as usual. Okay. We cut to the church and see regular... Another very odd thing is nobody mentions, uh, Yuli. Yuli, the person who is Yulius's brother, the kind of sick-ridden one that was delivering a letter that has to do with gluttony. 
I feel like Gluttony has eaten Yuli's name and memory. Who knows? Maybe that person also, you know, got remmed. No one's talking about Yuli. Nobody has ever mentioned Yuli. And Yuli was also delivering a letter. And a letter always gets fucked up in ReZero. Season 1, the blank letter from Rem. Season 2, the letter meant for Amelia that never made it there, right? Yuli also had a letter in Season 3 to deliver, and I bet something terrible happened. And see, regular said Amelia. Alright, god damn it. I keep saying Yuli instead of Yoshua. God fucking damn it. Yoshua, you're right, you're right. Yuli is the nickname. <laughs> Yuli is the nickname of Yulius when Yulius wants to be not a knight. Yoshua. That's the little bro. ...in their wedding outfits, as Regulus thinks how smart of a choice it was to leave the 79th seat open. She then asks why it was open, and he responds that there was someone who fit it before, but... So yeah, Fortuna. Hundreds of years ago. And Regulus was there, pre-ordering Amelia at the same time. Basically, buy one, get one free deal. Right? He was only going for Fortuna, but he ended up getting Amelia too. But the 79 slot. Something changed and he cannot marry them. Emilia has a few things to tell Regulus before they get married and he agrees. It's only natural to discuss things before marriage. First things first, Emilia is forbidden to smile. He goes on a rant about people falling out of love. If you love them, why would you drift apart over something as trivial as mere aesthetic differences? That's why he chooses based on faces. As long as they have a face he loves, his love will never fade. Even if they are a serial murderer or don't pick up their clothes. Some people become ugly when they smile. Really, any and all change. That's right, that's why you can never not smile. Sorry, you should never smile. I've seen a girl laugh, and it ruins my image of them in my head, therefore you're not allowed to smile. He is this peak incel. Just expression out of bounds. He can't bear to think their faces might become ugly. If you weren't sold on my prior comparisons to Regulus and Super before, I feel this one really drives it home. Not that Super is out there calling people ugly because they smile, because Regulus is supposed to be a much more extreme and twisted version of old Super's ideals, mm. which makes it so fitting that they will be pit against each other. It's just so funny that Regulus is pretty much like the most, the most like average like Reddit mod, Discord mod. It's just fat neckbeard who has these expectations that is insane of the opposite sex as they only treat that opposite sex as an object of desire. Knees too pointy, would not fuck. You know, that kind of thing. Treats them, again, figurines, right? They're like figurines to him. He collects them. And he has this like idealized vision of what a wife we should be. And if a laugh suddenly breaks that image because she starts laughing and the face becomes distorted, he, he just he just loses it. He's just the fucking. He, he has no convictions. He's got no. When they become old, well, guess why they all die, bro. I also brought up the whole Leonardo DiCaprio example, right? Whenever you know DiCaprio's new girlfriend hits the age of twenty-five, what happens? He dumps them and he picks up a new one, fresh out of high school, eighteen. And then there's a time limit until 25. It's a pattern of behavior, right? This is not, you know, random occurrences. So you get too old, you're gone. And honestly, also, yeah, when I say they're gone, they dump, they're dang, they're dying. It's, and to the girls, I wonder if that's like a moment that they're waiting for. Kind of like, uh, what's his name? Not her, his name, her name, 184, right? She was like, you know what? Regulus is going to kill me right now. Finally, end to my suffering. And she smiles. I wonder if all the girls are like, death would be a better outcome than just living right now. Well, then again, you would wonder, then why don't they just, you know, just commit Sudoku themselves? I don't know. It's an abusive relationship. The girls are too scared to do it. I mean, who wouldn't be too scared to do it? But it, it's just a fucked up situation overall. If we free them, though, what happens to all the girls? I say we make them all into maids. Yep. Send it to Razal's plenty of mansion. Make them all employed there. I don't know. Super made a service level decision to follow Amelia and had an image of her in his head that she could never live up to. And now Regulus has done the exact same thing. The image of Amelia's unsmiling face that he never wants to change. Except he'll go as far as to never change unlike Subaru. Amelia says marriage is something happy. It happens when you find someone you really love and it's really amazing, so why do you refer to your wives as a number? He dodges. It's a fixation on form of address, another mode of obsessing over form. Lack of confidence in your ability to continue your love without unnecessary trappings. Emilia agrees, but she doesn't hate it when Subaru calls her Emilia-tan. 
Here we EMT. Go. Regulus freezes. That's a man. You're standing at the altar with me and saying another man's name. You vile wench. Or you dare mention another man's name in front of me? Isn't that irrational? It's hurtful, in fact. You know that, right? It's as if it's a violation of his rights. <laughs> Regulus tells the entire hall full of wives not to move, or he'll erase everything below her head, pointing straight at 184. Emilia tells them that she hasn't loved someone before, but she knows who she will love. I will not be yours. A powerful crack resounded through the chapel, the and kick. something struck Regulus head on. A wooden door, to be precise. Subaru can't help but remark how the results of them kicking the doors in was so different, and Regulus says they have some nerve barge. Alright, Subaru did also kick, but his didn't really budge at all. <laughs> Reinhardt's just, boom, boom. Going into a sacred wedding. Who are you and what gifts have you brought? Natsuki Subaru, a spirit knight whose spirit is currently not present. And Reinhard von Astrea of the Sword Saint family. Subaru points at Regulus, his expression hardening. I object to this wedding. I'll be taking that bride. There it is. And thus, the curtains fall on ReZero Season 3, Core 1. Hey, Regulus also had no best man. Should have mentioned that. Bro has no friends. He has fucking nobody. It was just a fucking. There, there was also, you know, no, I guess. What's the person? The person kind of conducting the marriage, right? Some sort of like pastor type. Also, I wish the color here palette was like lighter. It's too dark. It's too dark, bro. I wish it was more bright. Saint family. Subaru points at Regulus, his expression hardening. I object to this wedding. I'll be taking that bride. And thus, the curtains fall on ReZero Season 3, Core 1. Wah, wah. All in all, what'd you guys think of this core? Anime. This core. Eight episodes. Technically, I think it's closer to 11 or 10 episodes. Because the first episode was what? 90 minutes long? If you consider the average watch time of an anime episode to be 23 minutes and 40 something seconds, right? And also, that also includes the opening and the intro. And you consider what's just the actual episode duration, close to like 20 below that. You could assume the first episode was basically three to four episodes in one, right? This is a pretty decent season. It is not like the best I've seen from ReZero, right? I still think that season one is just so impactful to me. It's the reference point, the bias, right? It's because it's my first time witnessing a story like this, and it was just so, so touching. Doesn't mean season two is bad or season three. They're both great. But to me, season one is still like the best. And here's another thing. Season one had multiple fucking arcs and conclusions. And it's done. Season three, we've only had eight episodes. We're still setting up. The real payoff is about to happen in, you know, the second half of this arc of arc five. Think about it like this too, like season two, right? A lot of people for ReZero season two, I bet if they only watched... Just like the halfway point until straight bed is met. Basically, Amelia's still crying and Amelia can't do anything. A lot of people would not have that favorable of a judgment because it's like nothing has been paid off yet. So you should wait until, you know, to give the actual final score. But season three for me, this shit's like a minimum 8.5, 9. It could be a 9 point something. Like, it's really good. And ReZero is my bias. But. And there were really standout episodes. The Capella episode was fucking crazy. The speech episode was so impactful. Even the first episode was just so rich and rich in lore. But I think we should just wait, right? We should wait for the second half of this season. And I'm sure I can confidently say this is just another 9 point something as I always write ReZeros. I mean, only novel readers. Please let me know. Because I've been trying to cast as wide net as possible on this to determine how things are going. I would love to hear your thoughts. Overall, a pretty solid core ender. The mm -hmm. character art of the season has been exceptional so far with great lighting and great backgrounds. Uh, and also some great character acting. I'm just hoping that this core ender is good for the enemy always to stay locked in. Uh, line yeah, split core, you lose the attention of the average monkeys. I mean, it's only December and, you know, January that we gotta wait. It's a two-month wait. Will a split core really impact the hype of ReZero? We'll see about that. I can wait for February to come. If you're an anime only, please do let me know. Um, we have Subaru, Reinhardt, and Amelia versus Regulus, Liliana and Priscilla versus Sirius, Wilhelm and Garf against Capella, and Julius and Ricardo against Gluttony. And Al ain't doing shit. Al does nothing. 
We have a few cuts this episode that I think are kind of sad. Uh, the anime has been kind of sucking out the tension of some scenes, and I'm not sure why, but first mm -hmm. things first. Upon Reinhardt's entrance, he apologizes to everyone for being so late, and Subaru goes, yeah, what the hell, man? Oh, right, right, right. When Reinhardt casually shows up at the end of, you know, the speech episode, everyone just kind of is, just, you know, is happy about it. A lot of people are actually pissed off. They're like, where the hell were you? Right, and Super is the one person that kind of like brushed it off after kind of questioning. And asks if he can count on him. Reinhardt replies that he will live up to his expectations. Reinhardt and Otto explain their circumstances, with Otto telling Subaru he will pay back his debts so Subaru can save the city. He was letting Subaru know that he wouldn't let him shoulder the fate of the city alone. Okay. As Subaru feels an intense embarrassment at having his tough guy act seen through. Who did Subaru think he was? I mean, the tough guy act, right? That's been a thing since season 2 of Otto always trying to be there for him in the sanctuary and you don't have to do this shit alone. Someone who could decide the fate of a city? A symbol of hope in the people's wishes? Yeah. It's ridiculous to even imagine. Yeah, imagine for him, but I think a lot of people are actually seeing him as a symbol of justice, symbol of hero, some All Might shit. Like, have a statue of him doing this. After that speech, and if he delivers this, I bet the people of Pristilla will see him as a symbol of a hero. Otto tells them if they take his little strength and Otto's little strength and add on Garfield's stupid amount of strength, it all adds up to something quite sizable in the quest to save the Watergate City. Okay. Next, after hearing about the Tome of Wisdom being in Otto's possession, the air in the room grows cold. Julius accuses him for being to blame for this, but Otto Imagine Al kills Otto because he has the Tomb of Wisdom. Probably would never have. But that is quite peculiar that he, he did leak it. it. This wasn't private. He didn't just tell... He told everyone in the room. <laughs> Al suspicious as fuck. What was he thinking? He's like, oh? You got the Tomb of Wisdom? Hold up. Otto fires back, implying it's all the fault of Anastasia for bringing them here to begin with, if they want to use that logic. Julius apologizes, and Otto looks at Subaru, telling him they will discuss it later. I still think Anastasia is to blame, because she knew what was going on. I, I have no doubt that she was aware of what's going to happen to Pristilla, and she invited every royal candidate because this is the only outcome that could possibly win against the witch cult. Subaru informs the room that Beatrice is an artificial spirit and tells Otto about Amelia's contact, who is blown away that she did something that sophisticated. With Amelia's info and Otto's recollection of gluttony, they can narrow down who was in every tower. Subaru asks Al what he's sulking about, and Al replies he isn't sulking. It wouldn't be cute for an old man like him. Subaru tells Al he wants him to yeah, Al is pretty old. To help out this time, fight the good fight so we can save his love. Subaru asks this, holding his hand out to Al, and in response, however, Al told him if that's really how he feels, he isn't against helping out, brushing away Subaru's hand in annoyance. Things are much more tense between Al and Subaru in the novels. A couple more small pieces of cut content first. We actually knew that Kurgan died a long time ago in the novels. Mm. Back during Volume 8 or Arc 3, we learned that the two most famous archbishops are Sloth and Greed, with yep. Regulus being most known for going to Valachia and destroying the city of Garkla in his warpath. That's right, the Meteor that was spurting cloud of a different witch, Regulus sent by the witch cult because they only worship the Witch of Envy. Also killing the hero of Valachia, Adarbs Kurgan. Second, I'm not sure why this was cut, but if you were wondering what fight Al is going to, uh, it's none. <laughs> what's he doing, Al bro? Al, what's, what the fuck is Al doing? Ugh. I hope that he'll clutch for us somehow. You know how he did most likely drown Pristella and it did help us out. If, even if he's got a different agenda, I would at least hope that he will do something behind the scenes that will help us out. Al and the Iron Fang are tasked with staying behind to protect City Hall, and the fact that the anime cut this makes Al look weirdly inconsistent about his drive to protect Priscilla. The last cut is a very small one at the end of the episode, where Regulus is about to start attacking Amelia. She mm. isn't just sitting there ready to die. She oh yeah, I heard that as well. Because a lot of people were kind of upset and frustrated that Amelia would just kind of sat there closing her eyes and just hoping that someone would save her, right? It's like, nah, I, I think she actually did something. It takes a battle-ready stance as the two are about to trade blows, then Reinhardt and Subaru come in. Um, I have no idea why this didn't make it in, considering it's a couple of frames at most, but it's another cut of someone in ReZero doing cool stuff for some reason. Amelia's not just sitting there waiting for Regulus to kill her, it's, it's kind of a kick in the balls to Amelia's story of not waiting for people to do things for her. Kicking Amelia's balls. And that will do it for ReZero Core 1. All Please right. subscribe if you would like to stay tuned for Core 2. Thank you, Mr. Asarata, for a whole eight weeks of cut content and reviews and analysis that we were able to farm. I really enjoyed his other videos on, like, was the, that was the other video about, you know, why people get into discourse and 
you know, argue about different points. This guy, I feel like is a huge big brain. When I, I, I as a monkey like me, when I watch his videos, something about him sounded smart. So I'm like, yep, I think he knows what he's talking about. Please go check out Mr. Asarat's channel, and we'll see you next time.